and I've got to follow that. <laughs> good morning. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Welcome to service this morning. We welcome those who are watching by YouTube. Uh, you bless us with your presence. This is the second Sunday in Pentecost, second Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, so we hope this service is a blessing to you. I have a bunch of announcements, so we're going to try to get through them as quickly as we can. Uh, we did hold Synod Assembly this past weekend, Friday night and Saturday. It ended early because they did it virtually by Zoom, and nothing squashes conversation than doing a whole Synod Assembly over Zoom. So uh, what was supposed to go till 4 o'clock yesterday went till 2 o'clock. Uh, Natalie Kratzer was elected to a position, as was Marsha Roscoe. Uh, I know those are names that you know uh, from this congregation. And um, so there was nothing really earth-shattering out of uh, Synod Assembly. This is not an election of a bishop year. So it, was, it came and went very quickly, except for those who did all the planning. So we thank them for that. Uh, let's see here. Committees this week, I know worship and music meets tomorrow night at 6.30. Uh, we're going to be in person for that, Bill, is that right? And then uh, Tuesday night, stewardship and uh, preschool board have meetings Tuesday night. Uh, we recognize our graduates today. They will be recognized in our prayers of intercession, but we do recognize those who are graduating, James Abraham, Jocelyn Byers, Kyla Peterson, Sophia Diddy, Caitlin Rager, Alex Waxmonski, those are our high school graduates. And then, uh, oh boy, I better put my glasses on for these. Katie Lamondo is graduating from Stonehill College. Uh, Carly Ann Dibler graduated from the University of Pittsburgh uh, Pharmacy. Um, Henry Will graduating, uh, Renette, oh boy. Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, and Delaney Higgins graduated from Drexel University. So are any of those folks here this morning? Is Carly here? Carly, stand up, Carly. Let's give her a round, come on, stand, let's give her a round of applause. She deserves it. We could, we could applaud for Sophia's mom, she's here. We could applaud for uh, Lisa for not crying yesterday. Uh, she's not even listening to me, so. Um, Anyway, so those were our graduates, and again, we'll uh, lift them up in prayer today. Uh, celebrations this week. Melissa Markey and Carter Klein have birthdays today. Are either one of those folks here? Melissa? No? Karen Luft and Elizabeth Stevenson have birthdays tomorrow. Pat Dirk, Margaret Gruber, Margaret Amon, and Wyatt Yakel on June 8th. Deb Weiss and Cody Zerfoss on June 9th. Henry Welsh, no, that's Harry Welsh, Madison Curry and Mackenzie Curry on June 11th, and Todd McCormick on June 12th. Any of those folks here? Happy birthday, no. And then anniversaries, I wondered, why are there so many anniversaries in June? But people used to get married in June. Now they get married Christmas Eve and on a Thursday. It drives me crazy. <laughs> Wedding anniversaries, Claire and Barbara Fry, on June 6th, are they here, Claire and Barbara? No? Uh, Brian and Karen Parr on June 9th, are they here? No? Michael and Nancy Erdman on June 9th. Any anniversaries or birthdays we missed? No. We're praying for Joyce Miller. We're adding Joyce to the prayer list. She is in Hershey Rehab with back issues. Uh, we continue to pray for giant Diane Schubert for Tom Dirk, for Rod Holland, Reverend Sharon Blessard, and Lynn Yost. Do I hear an echo? Is that, is that me or is that, that's me. I'll try not to echo for the rest of the service, if I can. Well, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship with the prelude.
I invite you to please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. Let's take a moment and think about the ways we've not loved our neighbor as we should. We have not loved God as we should. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the light in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. All-powerful God, in Jesus Christ you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of of the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. The first reading will be from Genesis. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures, Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. We will read the psalm responsively. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. If you were to keep watch over sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, in order that you may be you. I wait for you, O oh Lord, my soul waits. In your word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who keep watch for the morning, more than those who keep watch for the morning. O oh Israel, wait for the Lord. For the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord there is plenteous redemption. The Lord shall be Israel of all sins. The second reading will be from 2 Corinthians. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with the scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak 
because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an internal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what we can see, but at what we cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. Thank you, Phil, uh, Bill, for doing Phil. I called him Phil for gospel. Thank you, Bill, for pulling double duty this morning. Uh, well. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. We will read the gospel acclamation together. Alleluia. The ruler of this world will be driven out, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables, saying, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, standing outside. They sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Where are you? You hear so much in that simple question. You can hear fear as, as if a child is lost and a parent is running around the mall frantically trying to find them, shouting, where are you? Or you can hear anger. If a teenager is out beyond their curfew and the parent is talking to them, shouting to them over the phone, where are you? But you can also hear curiosity, as if someone came to visit you and you no longer live where they thought you used to live. As I see it, the question, where are you, implies movement. It suggests that we are not where we were supposed to be or where we were last, but now we are somewhere new. I mean, ultimately, we all are somewhere, right? Or at least, we hope we all are going somewhere. Where are you? Doesn't have to simply imply a physical presence somewhere. It can mean more of an existential question. 
a philosophical question, you know, regarding your faith, where are you? Regarding your political leanings, where are you? Maybe just in life in general, where are you? God asks this seemingly innocuous question in our first reading, standing in the garden, and we soon find out something very interesting is going on. Life in the Garden of Eden was simple. God made the garden paradise for Adam and Eve. A beautiful place of sustenance and companionship. How do we know this? Well, here is God just strolling along in the garden. Just strolling along. In the breezy time of the day, he's in no hurry. God knows where Adam and Eve are, are, or at least are supposed to be. But what God does not know is that everything already has fallen apart. Up to this point, the relationship between God and humans had been one of trust and obedience. The humans were relying completely upon God who, by the way, gave them everything they needed. God had given them one command. We know that command, right? Do not eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, lest you die. God made sure they had everything they needed, but like oftentimes in life, it came with boundaries. And they accepted the boundaries, at least, until evil came to town. The snake, that crafty creature, quickly seduces the woman with lies. It's just the thing that evil is good at, right? Questions the command that God had given them regarding the eating of the tree of knowledge. Eve says, we're not to eat of this tree, lest we will die. She goes on to add her own feeling about this command. We're not even supposed to touch it. The snake, evil that comes into this relationship, says you will not die. In fact, you'll become more like God. So she eats and she gives some to her husband, Adam. And we know the rest of the story. Nothing will be the same in their relationship, even their relationship with God. You know, how crafty are the voices of evil and deceit and dissension? I was listening to the news this week on NPR. It's not the only news station I listen to, but I was interested because they were talking about the frustration of the status of truth in our society today. And they gathered several different prominent news anchors talking about how trying to find some sense of truth and providing truth to our country today is so difficult because it's too easy to just get yourself a, micro, a microphone and begin a podcast show and spout whatever truth you believe. And soon you will gain a following depending on how sensational or how provocative you are. You don't need truths, really. Just your own conspiracies and a small amount of half-truths or conjectures. See, evil lies among the half-truths of our world. Just ask Adam and Eve. Along comes God with that question, where are you? They had never hid from God before. God, had, God never had trouble finding Adam and Eve in the garden. But now the voices of Adam and Eve come from behind some bushes somewhere. And immediately God knows there is trouble in paradise. I often read this passage, and I picture God standing there with his arms crossed, 
you know, like a good parent would, tapping his holy toe. And immediately, Adam and Eve begin the pass the buck game. Begins with Adam. He says, well, that woman you gave me, she gave me the treat, the fruit from the tree of life. Oh, and yeah, sure, I ate it, but, you know, she gave it to me. He implicates Eve, and then he blames God. You've got to be careful when you blame God. Before he finally says, oh, yeah, yeah, I ate it. Why, why do people do and why do people say the things that they do and the things they say? We don't always know the reasons behind people's actions. But isn't it funny how hard it is for people to accept responsibility for their actions? There's something about the human experience that pushes us to find blame anywhere else we can until finally, hopefully, we uh, come to ourselves and take the blame back to where it originated, which is within ourselves. The Lord then turns to Eve and he says, what have you done? And she passes the buck. She says, well, the serpent tricked me. Oh, and yeah, sure, I ate it, but it's the serpent's fault. Taking an assessment of your life usually begins with the question, where are you? question is thick with implication. It's thick with intrigue. It was true for Adam and Eve. It's true for Jesus in our gospel lesson today. The mother and the brothers of Jesus ask seemingly the same question. They're looking for Jesus. Where are you? Jesus is out of his mind, people are saying. The religious leaders are saying he's demon-possessed. For whatever reason, whether it's to save his life or to save the family further embarrassment, they all want to bring Jesus in. They want to control the message. Jesus is not when any of the religious leaders thought the Messiah would be. The family of Jesus is not so sure what to make of this kid that they've all known through his whole life as just one of the family, and now he claims to be the Son of God. Everyone is concerned that Jesus has no idea what he's doing. He's not right in his mind, they say. Not only is it our human nature to allow evil to come in and sow dissension and division amongst us. It's also our human nature to make judgments about what is normal or what is natural or what is God-ordained. So many people want to judge others by their own standards, or they claim that they are the ones who know the mind of God. And that becomes the measure by which they judge the actions and the words of others. The religious leaders want to intervene. The family of Jesus wants to have an intervention a la Dr. Phil. That's where I got the Phil from, Bill. It was. They, again, they want to rein him in. They want him to fit their own needs and their own wants. And if they can't, well, they'll just silence him altogether. Where are you? That's the question this morning. Where are you in your journey of faith? Are you like Adam and Eve in the garden, hiding wherever you can, afraid to answer the Lord when he comes calling you, seeking more of a relationship in your life? Are you like the mothers and brothers of Jesus, struggling with what it means to be different from the norm, the norm here being what society might think of people who put their religious beliefs first? 
You know, when it comes to our relationship with God, my friends, we too stand in front of God naked like Adam and Eve. God sees us as we really are. God knows the naked truth about us, and that makes us uncomfortable. Where are you? God knows who you are, my friends. God knows where you stand. The hidden question that stands behind that question, who, where are you, is the question, whose are you? Our baptisms answer that question, of course. Through our baptisms, we are chosen as God's children. We belong to God. We are bound in a relationship that is to divine. It is supposed to define our wheres and our whats and our whys and our whens and our hows in our life. Just like Adam and Eve continued to be children of God, God continued to be in relationship with them. God defines whose we are. But does God define your where are you? The struggle that we all deal with each and every day, the struggle that we wrestle with is how to live faithfully with Jesus at the very being and the very doing in our daily life. If we value that relationship with God, if we entrust our very selves with Jesus, then we should face life with the courage and the faith and the conviction to take on the responsibility of our faith. Stand up. Stand up to society. Stand up to the dissension that is sown by evil. Stand up for the truths of our faith. It is our responsibility. Responsibility. We should divide that word in the two. Response ability. You see, when you are baptized, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You are marked with the cross of Christ forever. The Holy Spirit then gives each one of us the ability to respond to God's gifts that we have been entrusted. No more passing the buck. No more blaming others for our actions. No, no more blaming others for our inaction. If we call ourselves Christians, then each of us have a responsibility or the response ability to say the buck stops here. And that begins with each one of us admitting that we stand naked before God as human beings, less perfect, filled with sin. But you see, when we say the buck stops here, we also show our trust and our faith in God through Jesus Christ who forgives us and calls us to live in a community of forgiveness and response and action and grace. You might ask, where is the grace in the story of the Garden of Eden? We know where evil lives in this story. Where is the grace? The grace comes in the fact that Adam and Eve do not die. God does not smite them. Instead, God clothes them with earthly clothing and he clothed them with amazing grace. What about the story of Jesus and his family? Where's the grace in that story? We know his family might have been embarrassed or afraid for his safety, but Jesus did not give in to the peer pressure. Some of his family continued to follow him. Some of his family continued to support him all the way to the cross. And we know God continued to strengthen Jesus. 
support him as he hung from the cross, listening to the will of the Father, Jesus, in essence, says, the, the buck stops here. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. So I ask you one more time, where are you? Today you are here, or watching at home at least, gathering with a community of faith, admitting that you need this faith community. You need the grace of God found in Jesus Christ. You have made a statement to the world that you know a truth about whose you are. You belong to the Lord who gives us all life. God accepts you just as you are. No preconditions. So let's stop passing the buck about God's truth. Let's live according to Paul's, wor Paul's words. Do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Renewed through faith renewed through the calling of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Please stand as you are able. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. God of wholeness, we pray for believers all over the globe. Unify us in the service of the gospel that we may work together as beloved siblings to share your love with all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of the cosmos, we pray for creation, the gardens, waterways, and creatures near to us and diverse forms of life that remain unseen. Teach us to treat the natural world with reverence, always seeking restoration for your creation Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of all people, we pray for harmony among the nations. Cast out from us unclean spirits of greed and fear that we may work in solidarity with one another for the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of righteousness, we pray for this holy house of worship. Set our gaze upon things eternal that in thanksgiving for your mercy, we may extend grace to more and more people. We lift to you those on our prayer list and those we name in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of abundance, we pray for those who are oppressed or in any need. Encourage those who have begun to lose heart and renew us with your spirit. We call upon you to bless those who are celebrating birthdays this week, including Melissa, Carter, Karen, Elizabeth, Pat, Margaret, Wyatt, Margaret, Deb, Cody, Harry, Madison, Mackenzie, and Todd. And the wedding anniversaries of Claire and Barbara, Brian and Karen, and Michael and Nancy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of opportunity, we give thanks for those men and women who are graduating this spring, including James Abraham, Jocelyn Byers, Kayla Pedersen, Sophia Diddy, Caitlin Reger, Alex Waxmonski, Katie Lamondo, Carly Ann Dibler, Henry Will, and Delaney Higgins. Bless them as they embark on new paths. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of the ages, in your goodness you have sent us faithful witnesses for every time and place. We give you thanks for those saints who now rest in your eternal mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we set the communion table.
Please stand as you are able. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, to give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these, your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we, and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet table where Christ gives himself as food and drink. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you did not grab a communion cup, you just need to raise your hand, and some of our ushers in the back will bring you one. If you do have it, we just take off the covering where the wafer is. We do this as a community of believers. So I ask that you just hold it up. This is the body of Christ given for you. Amen. We 
do the same with the wine or grape juice. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Please stand as you are able. Receive this blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your son's resurrection that we may show your glory to all the world through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. And finally, receive this blessing. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Will you go to serve the Lord? With the Lord's help, we will. Uh, please be seated. We have a postlude. 